Well, hey, Purpose students, it is so good to join you right now. And whether you're a parent or a student or a leader, we are so glad that you're here with us. And we miss you. We miss seeing you. We can't wait until we're back together. But it's really important that we remember in this season and in this time that though we are scattered, we have hope. I mean, that's why our series is called Scattered Hope. Because even though we're living in a time and a moment in history where we can't just move about the cabin as we would want to. We can't just go out and see our friends and hang out. And that's driving us a lot of us stir crazy. Maybe you're even feeling some Zoom fatigue and life just looks very different. You and I, if we believe in Jesus, we can have hope. And remember, hope is not wishful thinking that things will maybe get better. Hope is is a way of living, a reality that is more real than the TV or the tablet or the mobile device that you're watching this on. It's it's more real than anything you can see. It's a reality of life where you and I remember that God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. That Jesus promised to die for our sins, to rise from the dead, and he proved it. He kept that promise by actually coming back to life. And because he pulled that off, We can trust him with our whole lives. Even if it turns out differently than how you and I want, we can trust him. Last week, Pastor JT did an amazing job kicking off our series, talking about the good life and how the good life isn't living in sin or doing whatever we want to do. The good life is actually living in close relationship with Jesus. And today, as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, I believe that God has some warnings for us. And there might be some things that I say that challenge you, that stretch you, that maybe even offend you. But I hope that you'll just have ears open to hear and that you might tune in and, and, and lean into two warnings that I believe God has for us, and then one massive encouragement, especially if you're not in a relationship with Jesus right now, you need to hang on until the end because we're going to give you an opportunity to change that right now. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, we discover warning number one is this. If your life group isn't a priority, everyone loses. If your life group isn't a priority, everyone loses. Listen to how Peter talks about a community of believers, a life group. He says this, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. You hear how he uniquely describes this particular special community. I just have a few questions to ask you, and I just want you to be real honest with yourself. Question number one is this. Are you bringing your real self to your life group? Are you putting on a mask? Are you pretending everything's okay? Are you kind of sitting in the back? Or are you bringing your real self? Are you engaged? Question number two, are you really engaged? Do you just kind of sit there and wait for the time to end? Or are you fully engaged? engaged in your life group. And question number three is this, maybe you've never asked yourself this, but I challenge you to ask yourself this question. How does God want to use me in this life group conversation? How does God want to use me in this life group conversation? Now, as we look at this passage, maybe you hear some of those words and you think, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a really cool, ideal community, but life's really hard right now. I don't know if I can be sympathetic and and loving and compassionate, man. I'm Zoom fatigued. I'm frustrated at how life is going right now. My senior year looks completely different than what I dreamed it would look like. Well, remember, when Peter was writing this letter, He was writing to a group of people who were being heavily persecuted. I mean, they were literally afraid they were going to be murdered. And Peter said, even though when you're stressed and anxious and you're you're not inclined to bring your best self in the relationships that you have, as followers of Jesus, we got to lean into him and make our communities a priority and how we engage in those communities a priority. So Peter says, As followers of Christ, we should be like-minded. This means we should seek unity. In your life group, are you seeking unity? Are you assuming the best about people? When somebody joins life group a little late, are you ragging on them or are you extending grace? If somebody hasn't been there in a little while, are you quick to jump on them and make them feel guilty? Or are you kind? Are you understanding? 
That leads into number two. He says, be sympathetic, which means to seek understanding, to ask clarifying questions. I want to challenge you to not be multitasking during your life groups. Don't kind of jump in your life group and check Instagram or play a video game or kind of you know, take even your camera off so that you can do whatever you want. That just signals to all of us that you're not really engaged. Don't multitask, prioritize this community. He says, thirdly, love each other. When you love each other, you are seeking time. You know, I, I, I read in this book recently. In fact, it's an amazing book. If, if you're looking to deepen your relationship with God, I want to encourage you to pick up this book. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. If you're looking for a good read, this is an amazing book. And one of the things he talked about in there, one example, he was talking about how the way kids spell love is T-I-M-E. And I don't think we ever really outgrow that. That one of the ways we love each other is by giving our time to each other, leaning in and listening when the other person is sharing. Peter says, be compassionate. This means you're seeking to feel what they're going through. Do you really allow yourself to internalize some of the pain and the hardships that those in your life group are experiencing? And then lastly, he says, be humble, which means to seek to bring care even though you may never fully understand. There may be somebody in your life group who shares a life experience, uh, an adversity that they have faced, a challenge that they've overcome, and honestly, you've never gone through that before. You don't need to feel the pressure to say, oh, I totally understand, because you don't understand. But what you can do is you can say, I love you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Choose to be humble, recognizing you won't ever fully understand, and that's okay, but you can still lean in and listen and love them. And then Peter says this, and when someone hurts you, not if someone hurts you, but when someone in your life group hurts you, choose to respond by blessing them. Maybe there's somebody in your life group right now or in your family, your friends, who they've wronged you, and you really want to repay evil with evil. Peter says, as people who are scattered but have hope, we need to choose to respond to evil and attacks and even other people's sin that spills over into our lives, respond with blessing them. I was talking with this missionary once who was a missionary in West Africa for over 20 years. And I asked her, what was the major difference that you experienced between Africa and the United States? And then she just said this line. She said, you know, in the U.S., You have to make appointments in order to see your friends. And I just thought, man, even in this day and age, you and I can become so busy and so disconnected that we don't make time for the most important things. In fact, we'll binge watch every Netflix show. We'll play video games literally all throughout the night, but we won't prioritize a phone call or we won't prioritize texting back. And so here's what I want you to do. Here's my application for you. I want you to pick the quality that you are weakest at. Being like-minded, being sympathetic, being loving, compassionate, or humble. Pick that quality that you are weakest at and intentionally train that spiritual muscle. Students, it's going to surprise you, but you don't get these guns just by eating cereal. You know what I mean? You want want big guns like Pastor Eric? You got to train those muscles. But I want you to think about this in terms of your relationship with Christ. It's true. Any muscle that you want to strengthen, you have to target it. You have to work at it. You have to strengthen. Strengthen, you have to train. The same is true in our relationship with God. If you're not a compassionate person, the answer is not, well, that's just not who I am. No, the answer is to position yourself to have conversations with people where you will need to show compassion and pray constantly, God, help me to show compassion. Which of those qualities are you weakest at? And I want to challenge you this week to sharpen those and to train those. Warning number two is this. If Jesus isn't set apart, then he has no part. In other words, if Jesus isn't set apart in your life, the question is, does he really have any part in your life? Jump to verse 15. Peter says this, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. This idea of revere means set him apart. In your hearts, set him apart as being the most important thing in your life. And many scholars believe that Peter's writing this to a group of people who they're so used to gathering and they're so used to being in community and being able to remind each other by their physical presence with one another. They're able to remind each other 
that Jesus Christ is their most important priority, that God is good, that, that God will save them, that, that God loves them. They're so used to that. But Peter is saying, you can't really do that anymore. You can't meet up as easily as you could before. But what you can do is in your own hearts, make sure that Jesus Christ is your number one. You see, I, I want to ask you this question. Has the coronavirus propelled you forward or pulled you back in your relationship with Jesus? I know I've talked with some of you, you were on fire for Christ before coronavirus, and now you're li- you haven't opened your Bible or prayed or even thought about God in weeks. I mean, you're spending your time somewhere, you're doing something, but because of this coronavirus, man, you have pulled back in your relationship with Christ. Friends, because we may be scattered, does not mean that we don't have hope. And because you have hope, I believe God wants to use this coronavirus season to propel you forward in your relationship with Jesus. So here's three things I want you to do to make sure that Christ is set apart in your lives. Number one is this. I want you to make a list of daily goals. So maybe you do that the night before. Maybe you do it the first thing you wake up in the morning. I want you to make a list. What are you going to accomplish that day? Number two, on that list, I want you to make sure that you are reading one chapter in the Bible. I would encourage you, if you're not in a reading plan right now, start reading John, the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the fourth gospel. John loved Jesus. He knew Jesus. And when he writes about Jesus, it's so emotional. His stories are so powerful. You are going to get a front row seat to Jesus. And when you're reading John, here's what I want you to think about. Two questions. Number one, who is Jesus? Number two, how do I follow him? When you're reading the Bible, that's what I want you to do. Ask yourself as you're reading any passage, who is Jesus? How, who am I discovering Jesus to be in this passage? And number two, how do I follow him? And then number three, I want you to daily reach out to one person and say, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? How can I pray for you? So those are your three challenges. Now, let me give you an encouragement. God wants you to have hope and he wants you to to share hope. Look at how that verse ends. Verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Peter says, look, there's a hope living inside of you, and it's not something you made up. It is the hope of Christ that is living inside of you. Be ready to share it. Number one, recognize God has downloaded hope into your heart and your life. And number two, be ready to share that. Here's the reality. Hope equals Jesus plus community. When we have Jesus and we have community, we find ourselves full of hope. Students, hope has to be shared. Hope has to be shared. Someone say that in the chat right now. Hope has to be shared. Don't be a hope hoarder. Come on, share the hope of Jesus. Share how Jesus has changed your life. Share this link with somebody of how God is using Purpose Students Live or whatever he's doing in your life. Share that. I was talking with Laura this week. She's our fifth, sixth, and junior high coordinator. She told me a story that for her entire sophomore year of high school, every single day she would invite a friend named Allie to youth group. She'd say, come to youth group with me, and Allie would say no. She'd say, come to youth group with me. Allie would say no. All year long, she invited Allie, and Allie consistently said no. Once Allie got to college, she wrote a message to Lauren. She said, guess what? I've started following Jesus. And then she said this. She said, thank you. Thank you for showing me what a Christian, what a Christ follower looks like. Students, share the hope. Even if your neighbors, your friends, your schoolmates, your teammates, even if they push back, even if they're not interested, share the hope of Jesus because you never know what seeds are being planted. Now, there's some of you right now who you don't have hope. In fact, you're looking for hope. You need hope. Here's the reality. Hopelessness is disconnection from Christ and disconnection from His community, but you can have hope. In in Hebrews, there's this awesome passage in Hebrews chapter four. It says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Did you know this? Jesus was tempted in every single way you've been tempted. But here's what's beautiful. He didn't give in to that temptation. But it, because he didn't give in to that temptation, he doesn't stand off at a distance and say, well, I did it. How come you couldn't do it? No, he says, I resisted temptation so that my holiness and perfection could cover your brokenness and your sin, which is why it says we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence. And so students don't feel guilty. Don't feel like, man, I can't be in a relationship with God because of all the things I've done. No, he wants you to approach him boldly. And so I want to encourage you to pray, to say, God, I give my life to you. God, I surrender my heart to you. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. Help me to follow you. And then number two, if you want to start following Jesus, I want you to go to purposechurch.com slash next steps. You can read that in the comments below. You read it in the chat, wherever you're at. Go to purposechurch.com slash next steps and let us know that you want to begin following Jesus so we can walk you through that. Hey, we love you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for every single student right now that is experiencing you. God, I thank you for Purpose Students Live, and I ask that you would have your way in this ministry, that you would have your way in our hearts, and that we would be people who prioritize our life group, who prioritize setting apart time for you, and that, God, you would do a great work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.